believe. And we're just really honored to have him here. I think you'll, it'll be a real treat for you. It'll be a, a time of when he speaks and gives us a presentation, and then there's a, we really want to interact with pastors. It'll be a time of question and answers. And so that's really the whole format of this, why it's a little bit more intimate, so you can ask him questions, get to know him from his heart. Um, one thing that I know, and this is what I really appreciated, he he's a, has a heart for evangelism, for especially reaching the lost. He's a, he's a, a conservative evangelical scientist, which is a, a real gift from God to reach the, the community. And so I've, I've benefited personally from reading his books and also uh, meeting him. And I believe you uh, will really do that here too. So uh, I think we're in for a real treat for first the presentation and also the question and answer. Just come on in and find your, your way there, uh, Dave and Scott and uh, whoever else. Just a, a couple, uh, we, we do have a book table in the back that uh, you'll have a chance uh, to read some of the books and, and uh, Dr. Ross has just finished writing a new book called Why the Universe is the Way It Is. And in fact, he'll be um, promoting that book and, and you can um, buy that book at a um, reduced price for pastors. This is a one day only $10 Price that normally we would sell it for 15, and if you were to go to chapters where he's going to do book signing tomorrow afternoon, it's 21. Um, but if you still want to do even better than that, if you fill out this card, we're going to give away three of them at some point, and we're going to um, take those cards a little bit later. So uh, uh, I just wanted to alert you to that, and we'll pick those cards up a little bit later. Um, the the other. Uh, thing I just wanted to uh, announce, and maybe uh, is that Brenda? Are you? I also want to acknowledge uh, the chairman of our board, Bruce Smith, who is really instrumental for this event today. He is also on the board of Reasons to Believe. So thank you, Bruce, for initiating this and uh, having us here. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for revealing yourself to us through the Word, uh, but also through the world. And we thank you for the unique gift that you've given uh, reasons to believe, and Dr. Hugh Ross in particular, for seeing evidence of your existence in the world around us. As Helmut has spoken about, we thank you for his heart of an evangelist who, uh, through his scientificness and through his knowledge of you, has been instrumental in leading many people to yourself. And today we pray that you would open up our hearts, that we would be informed, inspired, and edified, and better equipped to be your servants and your evangelists in the world. We thank you for the banqueting table. We thank you for these faithful women and for how uh, you're going to use them to bless us. We pray that your hand would continue to be upon them as they serve others in your name. And so for this food and for this time, we give you thanks and commit it to you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. And, and science. At one point, I was a, a geologist, and I really struggled with um, with combining the truth of Scripture and uh, uh, proper respect for for the Bible with what I was seeing in my own uh, geological uh, experience. And uh, Dr. Ross's books have um, helped me uh, in a tremendous way to have that relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus and the and, and the the recognition of the authority of scripture, and also to see um, some of the things which I've experienced in science and in, in my own experience in, as a geologist to, to coordinate those two so I don't have to keep them in separate uh, uh, categories in my life. And uh, so I, I can, I've been personally impacted by him and I believe that you can, uh, you'll be really treated, uh, treated to his presentation. So Dr. Ross. Well, uh, I'm still a pastor. Uh, I'm now the minister of apologetics at our church. So for 11 years I was minister of evangelism. Uh, for the past 23 years, uh, minister of apologetics. And uh, what I want to speak to you today about is how to integrate science and faith into church uh, ministries. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what we're about at Reasons to Believe, we're basically a team of research scientists, philosophers, and theologians 
that are focusing on developing new reasons to believe. But what I want to show you here is about a three minute uh, video clip that gives you a quick survey uh, of what we're all about. And I'm going to try to get this out of here. Established in 1986, the nonprofit organization, Reasons to Believe, is dedicated to integrating all of God's revelation into one comprehensive framework. At Reasons to Believe, we believe that the Bible is the error-free Word of God, error-free in all disciplines. We also believe that the record of nature is a trustworthy revelation from God. Therefore, we expect that the words of the Bible and the facts of nature will be completely compatible and consistent. And certainly, Christians are interested in what science has to say about God's world and how that physical world corresponds to the larger Christian worldview. Uh, reasons to believe certainly is at the forefront of doing that very thing. The cultural stronghold of evolution looms large in the minds of many Christians. But rather than treating non-believers as an enemy to be defeated, Reasons to Believe thinks there is a better way. Reasons to Believe is unique in that it is able to penetrate a lost people group of sophisticated intellectuals, university professors, lawyers, architects, people that have an academic problem with the truth claims of Christianity. If we want to be effective at reaching scientifically minded people for Christ, we have to be taken seriously by the scientific community. And in order to do that, we have to present credible science. Scientifically minded people do recognize that there are flaws in the Darwinian explanation for the history of life on planet Earth. But they will not abandon the Darwinian model until they see a superior model with greater explanatory power to take its place. Why would the scientific community take anything that we're saying about the gospel seriously if the science that we're presenting is nonsense? But if we can come in and provide an effective tool, this creation model approach that has scientific credibility, that then helps open the next door, which is a gospel presentation, and for the first time, often, they've never even gotten that far in conversations with Christians. In our interactions with them, instead of, uh, you know, chiding them or, or uh, mocking them, we actually invite them to ask questions. And what we're doing at Reasons to Believe with our creation model approach is taking the recent scientific discoveries made by the scientific community seriously, as well as taking scripture seriously. Yeah, maybe, maybe they don't immediately believe, but they are surprised that there is as much information that they can uh, get their teeth into. Reasons to Believe has been effective in reaching thousands of scientists, skeptics, and secular leaders for Christ around the world. But a lot more needs to be done. We invite you to partner with us in continuing this important work. We want to bring Reasons to Believe's testable creation model to university campuses, colleges, business firms, churches and schools as a way to introduce unbelievers to how they can have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe. So that gives you a brief idea of uh, what Reasons to Believe is all about. Uh, it's founded on the Belgic Confession, uh, one of the oldest uh, Reformation confessions. Article 2 says that we know him, God, by two means. First, by the creation, preservation, and government of the universe, since that universe is before our eyes, like a beautiful book, in which all creatures, great and small, 
our letters to make us ponder the invisible things of God. <clears throat> so it's this two books theology that God's given us the book of scripture, and he's also given us the book of nature, and the two uh, cooperate one another. Now what I'd like to do is just kind of play off some of my experience in uh, dealing uh, with non-Christian audiences. Saturday before last, uh, I was speaking at the an atheist conference on the Caltech campus. It was Friday night and all day Saturday. And they had six atheists uh, signed to speak, and then I came on and debated particle physicist Victor Stenger. That's how we kind of closed off the event. But in interacting with these 700 atheists, I kind of picked up, because you know, this is a talk I've given before to pastors, but I completely revised it based on what I learned Saturday before last. And so what I'm going to do here is kind of review for you the different science apologetics tools. <clears throat> and then I'm going to kind of focus in on a few of what I think are the more effective ways to use science to reach out to skeptics uh, in our society. Just give you kind of a little bit of, bit of a sampling. Let me just first take you through the list of the different science apologetics tools we've been developing at Reasons to Believe. Number one is to make the point that the scientific method comes straight from the pages of scripture. It's no accident that the scientific revolution came out of Christian Western Europe. It was these uh, early research scientists who were Christians who read the Bible and discovered this methodology of interpretation. And so what we do in communicating with engineers and scientists is remind them that they owe their science and engineering to the words of the Bible. That's where the scientific method comes from, where the scientific revolution arose. And then a second point is to emphasize the Bible's comprehensive scientific accuracy. You know, all the holy books of the religions of the world talk about science, but they do terrible in terms of trying to relate to the reality. I mean, you look at the Quran, uh, or look at the uh, Mormon texts, or the, the Hindu Vedas, they're filled with provable scientific errors. And when you compare them with the Bible, first of all, the Bible sticks its neck out on science way more than these other holy books. You've got more than ten times the scientific content in the Bible that you'll find in any other holy book undergirding the world's religions. That is accurate from cover to cover. It doesn't make mistakes. So uh, we can show that as a means for its inspiration. I mean, if men wrote it, there's going to be mistakes. But if inspired, that's not the case. And one way we can follow it up is to make the point that, <clears throat> when you look at the Quran, uh, there are three creation accounts, although one's born from the Bible. Likewise, in the Book of Mormon, you've got four creation accounts, but all four are born from the Bible, uh, with uh, certain changes in it that are not accurate. But most biblical, most uh, uh, holy books have one or zero accounts of creation. The Bible has 25 chapter length or longer creation accounts. You want to see them all, they're posted on our website. In fact, we post there every creation text that you'll see in the Bible. But this gives us an opportunity to fine tune our interpretation of creation from a biblical perspective. You know, for example, Genesis 1, uh, takes you through six creation days. Well, so does Job 38 and 39. So does Psalm 104. Uh, so does Proverbs 8. And uh, therefore, we have an opportunity not only to uh, uh, test our interpretation of Genesis 1, but also to flesh it out. For example, Psalm 104 contains much more scientific content than Genesis 1 does. And so it fills in uh, a lot of the material there. But the order and the description of the events is a powerful piece of evidence. In fact, in my debate with Victor Stenger, I ended with a point that if you look at the order of creation events we see in these biblical creation accounts, they're exactly what the scientific record testifies. And yet the Bible said this thousands of years before any scientists had a clue. And so we can use that as an argument. Now, number four <clears throat> is that many times that the Bible forecasts scientific discoveries. I'm going to give you some examples in a minute, but we're talking about the Bible predicting in detail uh, scientific discoveries thousands of years before any scientists even dreamed of the concept. You'll get an example in a minute. But then we have the ubiquitous evidence for the supernatural design of nature for the benefit of humanity. Uh, what my peers in astronomy call the anthropic principle. We look out at the universe and we see that it is fine-tuned design 
not just for the benefit of light, but for human beings in particular. The whole cosmos uh, was designed to provide us with a home. And then research directives for better management of Earth and its life. I'll bet all of you as pastors have gotten questions from your parishioners about global warming. The book of Job is loaded with a good response to global warming, very different from what you're hearing from Al Gore. You know, here's the oldest book of the Bible, and yet it's got modern-day insights to help us manage our modern world. And number uh, seven is the fact that all of Earth's life serves humanity. I'm going to be working on a book called Answers in Job next year, but the heart of that book is making the point, pick any species of life, alive today or in a fossil record. Each of those species serves a specific purpose with respect to the human species. All that life exists for us. And then science research directives for discovering new apologetics tools. Again, I can look at the book of Job. Job 38 and 39, uh, we've got God there asking 59 questions. The answers to those questions all unfold a new apologetic tool. You say, how well are we doing? Well, so far we can answer 10 of those 59 questions. We've got 49 more opportunities to uncover a new apologetics tool. And by the way, one of those 10 was just uncovered in the last nine months. So, creation's capacity to instruct humanity for success in this life and the next. And then the design for optimal observability. I was sharing with a few of you while we were picking up our food that one of the things we astronomers have discovered about the universe, there's only one time in the history of the universe where you get to see 100% of the history of the universe all the way back to the creation event itself. It only happens 13.73 billion years after the beginning of the universe. If you go a little bit later, you go a little bit less, you don't get to see the whole story. And not only that, we're at the one location. This universe of 50 billion trillion stars provides us with just one location where advanced life can exist, where that advanced life can actually see the entire observable universe. The universe has been designed to provide us with that one location where we can see the handiwork of God from the beginning of the universe to the present day. Astronomy is a tool where we directly witness the past. I have to keep reminding my wife that as an astronomer, I'm ignorant of the present, but I know about the past. <clears throat> it takes light time to travel from those stars and galaxies to our telescope. So when we look at a distant galaxy, we're seeing it as it was billions of years ago, not as it is today. And by looking farther and farther away, we can actually observe the entire history of the universe. Even the creation of the universe itself is now directly observable. But if we weren't at this right time and right place, that wouldn't be the case. And the consistency of biblical morality with optimal economic reward. How often do we hear in business environments, and we speak to a lot of business people, but making the point that you know, we have to make a choice uh, between ethics and economic reward. I don't see that. God has designed the universe and the earth in such a way that the most economically beneficial solution will be identical to the most ethical. You know, a recent example would be stem cell research. Uh, we now know, uh, through a lot of mistakes, that we're much better off using adult stem cells than embryonic stem cells. With embryonic stem cells, you get cancers you can't control. Uh, but if you take the stem cells at a later point uh, in the development of the fetus or the adult, uh, now you've got something you can work with and actually use it to multiply cells for an organ uh, of your choice. And so what we have there is the most economic solution being identical to the most ethical. Uh, with adult stem cells and late fetal stem cells, nobody has to die. Nobody gets hurt. In fact, what they're now thinking about is maybe when a baby is born, they should harvest some stem cells, put it in a refrigerator, and then when they get to be 60 years old and they need a, a pancreas, they can take the stem cells and make you a new pancreas as your pancreas, basically, they put back into your body. And then the stultification of scientific advance. You know, when I was addressing these atheists, I had to listen to six lectures from atheist scientists before I had my chance to debate Victor Stenger, and all of them were making the point that Christianity stultifies science. 
In fact, it's exactly the opposite. Atheism is what's stultifying scientific advance. Uh, for example, uh, how often do we hear that 98% of the human genome is useless? Well, they thought that that was because of evolutionary junk that got accumulated in our genome, and therefore nobody bothered to study that section that was, quote, labeled as junk for 35 years. Now, what overturned that was not some biologists, but a group of physicists, the majority of whom were theists, decided to do a computer analysis on what had been labeled junk for 35 years, and therefore not worthy of study. And what they discovered was that the language complexity of what they called junk was even higher than the language complexity of that part of the genome uh, that programmed for the manufacture of proteins. And that launched a revolution to look at the junk and find purpose. And so now we realize there is no junk, that all has purpose. But nobody bothered to look for the purpose because of the atheistic worldview. Bottom line, the more we learn about science, the more reasons we have to believe in Christ as creator, Lord, and savior. If you listen to our podcast called Creation Update, that's how we end the show every time, reminding people that science is the ally of the Christian faith, not the enemy, and literally every day new discoveries are being made. Matter of fact, as pastors, you can all sign up for what we call today's new reason to believe. Every day we post a new discovery on our website, and you can get that as a free email uh, to your computer. And frankly, if we had the scientific team, we could give you 10 a day. That's how vigorously scientific research is providing us with these new reasons. But let me just give you a little bit of a flavor uh, for some of the kinds of science evidences that are having the greatest impact in bringing people to faith in Christ who've never been to church. That's kind of our target mission field. We're targeting people who've never been to church in their life and are trying to communicate to them these new reasons. And it was none other than Sir Fred Hoyle, as a pantheist, who made the statement many years ago, there is a good deal of cosmology in the Bible. It is a remarkable conception. Well, he's right. The Bible contains more than 10 times as much content about the origin and structure of the universe as does any other uh, holy book. And there's mainly three points that the Bible repeats over and over again about the universe. It tells us repeatedly that the universe is traceable back to what physicists would call a cosmic singularity beginning, an actual beginning to matter, energy, space, and time. Number two, that the universe continuously expands from that point of beginning. And it expands under constant laws of physics. It expands under the influence of the second law of thermodynamics, which means that the Bible is telling us that the universe gets colder and colder as it gets older and older. Now, let me just show you a few of the passages. I'm sure most of you are aware of all these passages in the Bible that talk about the beginning of the universe, how the universe was formed at God's command. Hebrews 11.3 tells us it was not made out of what was visible, that the universe we detect came from that which we cannot detect. Other Bible verses not included here, but you'll find them in Timothy and Titus, tell us that when God created the universe, that's when he created space and time, and that God was actively involved in cause and effect phenomena even before space and time exist, even for our benefit. The grace of God that we now experience was put into effect before the beginning of time, 2 Timothy 1.9. Well, we live in a day and an age when we can actually prove this, and this is significant because if you look at what the other religions say about God and the universe, what they say is that God creates the universe within space and time, where space and time are eternal entities. The Bible stands alone in saying that God creates independent or outside of space and time. Now, thanks to the space-time theorems of general relativity, we can provide a rigorous proof that indeed there is a creation event, a beginning of matter, energy, space, and time. If the universe contains mass, and if general relativity reliably describes cosmic dynamics, then space and time must be created by some causal agent outside or transcending space and time. 
The first of the space-time theorems was published in 1970, but now those space-time theorems have been generalized to cover any possible model of the universe that would permit the existence of life. And also, we have increasing evidence that general relativity is true. The foundation of these space-time theorems is the reliability of general relativity. But today, general relativity ranks as the most exhaustively tested principle in all of physics and the best proven principle. We now know that general relativity reliably describes the dynamics of the universe to better than a trillionth of a percent precision. And the theorems are becoming more general. For a 10-year period, two theoretical physicists, Arvind Borde and Alexander Vilenkin, spent their time trying to see whether they could find some loophole around this beginning of the universe. Is it possible to conceive of the universe without a beginning, and without a beginning of space and time? Over the course of 10 years, they published these five research papers. But they wound up concluding that any universe <coughs> that expands on average must have a beginning in the finite past with an actual beginning of space and time. So any universe that expands on the average has this requirement that there must be a beginning of space and time. And the significant point, there only a universe that expands on average is there the possibility for physical life. So the fact that you're here proves that there must be an actual beginning to space and time and a causal agent beyond space and time or to quote what Borde, Belenkin, and Guth said in their last paper, all reasonable expanding universe models are subject to the relentless grip of the space-time theorems. Now, I've spent a few minutes on this because what I'm reviewing for you is what ranks as the most rigorous proof that a god beyond space and time created this universe. And what we've done here is to demonstrate to anyone's reasonable satisfaction that an undeniable miracle has occurred. You know, when people say, I don't see God performing miracles, you can see this one. We can look directly back in time and watch God create this universe of matter, energy, space, and time. And what bigger miracle is there out there that we could possibly observe? This is the biggest possible miracle, and it's a miracle that no one can deny. It kind of reminds me what I saw in the early part of the book of Acts. Remember when the uh, Sanhedrin got together? And we're talking about Peter and saying, this is a miracle that we can't deny. Likewise, we've got a miracle that no one can deny. Therefore, science must allow for the possibility of the supernatural. How often do I go and see a special on PBS where they say, science can only look for natural causes? This shows us that's no longer the case. Scientists must be open to both natural causation and supernatural causation. If the supernatural creator intervened once miraculously, certainly he has the right and the capacity to do it again. Now, when I was at this uh, atheist conference, it was interesting that when the Q&A time came, I could kind of tell that they felt that they weren't going to get me on the science, so they went after me on the Bible. And uh, they brought up all their point. The Bible teaches that the world is flat because it says four corners. I said, well, actually, what the Hebrew uh, figure of speech there is four quarters, not four corners, like the four quarters of an orange. So then they went after Genesis chapter 1. And one issue that came up was, what do you do with this enormous gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2? And then what they're referring to there, too, is that uh, you've got the universe in Genesis 1-1, and then it jumps 9 billion years forward out to the Earth. That's a huge gap of time. And uh, you know, how can you believe what Genesis is saying when it's got this incredibly big gap? Well, my response was that I don't think Genesis was the first creation account given to humanity. There's a lot of evidence uh, that Job's content, maybe not in written form, but Job's content predates the book of Genesis by several hundred years. And it's interesting that Job, as well as other creation accounts, fill in that gap. And what they basically talk about is how God stretched out the universe from the beginning to the point where we could have the sun, moon, and stars. 
And I find it fascinating the Bible actually has got more to say about the expansion of the universe than it does the beginning. These aren't all the verses, but they're enough to make the point that you've actually got more biblical content on the expansion. And you say, how come more people aren't aware of this? Because they're expecting to find it in Genesis 1. Notice that there's not a single verse you're going to find in the Torah. So you've got to get past the five books of Moses before you have any content on this expansion of the universe. But again, the principle is, if you want to correctly interpret the text, you really want to look at all 25 uh, creation accounts. Now, it was John Ray, the theologian, that pointed out to me a number of years ago that all these places in the Bible where it talks about the stretching out of the heavens, it's using the Hebrew verb natal. And he showed me how a better uh, definition for that verb natal is the continuous expansion of what's ever being described. And I looked at his evidence and said, yeah, you're right. They also made the point that these passages put it in three different verb forms, which again makes the point that God created the universe with a physics that would guarantee ongoing continuous expansion, the Cal-perfect form, but also seven of these uh, passages put it in the Cal-participle form, which means that God on an ongoing basis is controlling the continuous expansion of the universe. Job 9.8, God alone stretches out the heavens. Well. As an astronomer, I could give you very persuasive evidence, quite technical, that we do live in a universe that continuously expands. But thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, I can show you something without <coughs> equations. What I have here is an example of uh, two images taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. The one on the left is looking 12 billion light years away, uh, when the universe was only 2 billion years old. And what you see there is that the galaxies are small and jammed so tightly together that they're actually ripping spiral arms off from one another. We call these tadpole galaxies because of the way they're tearing spiral arms away from one another. Uh, but if you go forward in time to just two billion uh, years ago, two billion light years away, which corresponds to the universe being 12 billion years old instead of two billion years old, see how far apart the galaxies have moved. This is all the scale. The galaxies are bigger, and you see a yellow color. A yellow color is the color of old stars. Now, the purple and the red and the green you see are the color of youthful stars. The stars have gotten older, the galaxies have gotten bigger, and they've stretched apart from one another. So today, just by looking at the photo images, uh, we can show that we live in a continuously uh, expanded universe. And what we have here is just kind of a, a quick uh, view of the history of the universe that we can observe through our telescopes from the creation event through the cosmic background radiation all the way up to the galaxy or Milky Way galaxy in our sun's position the galaxy today. Well, there's about seven different passages in the Bible that talk about the fixity of the laws of physics. Here's one of them, Jeremiah 33, 25. God is speaking, I have established the fixed laws of heaven and earth. Uh, Romans and Genesis and Revelation, other places you can go, where it talks about how God creates the universe and maintains that physics up until the point that he conquers and removes evil. Then he brings about a new creation to replace this creation. And also we see in Romans 8 this statement, the whole creation groans subject to its bondage to decay. And if you read verses 18 to 23 together, you see that this is a direct reference to the second law of thermodynamics. You may know it as Murphy's Law. Uh, things get messy all by themselves without any human input. Usually human input speeds up things that became uh, rather than improving it. Uh, but the whole point is God designed this universe with his law of decay permeating the entirety of the cosmos. Well, if you have the second law of thermodynamics, constant laws of physics, and a universe that's continuously expanding, that's a universe that must get colder and colder by a highly predictable amount. So just taking what the Bible says, and incidentally, if you're not familiar with that, think of your car engine. Uh, when the piston chamber is large, the temperature is down. When the piston chamber is compressed, the temperature goes up. It's the same principle of constant laws of physics uh, under the um, in expansion and the second law of thermodynamics. But what I want to show you here, that black curve you see there, 
is what the Bible predicts about the cooling of the universe with respect to time. Then you get to see actual measurements overlapping it. And what you see is our measurements in distant gas clouds of the temperature of the radiation from the cosmic creation event indeed gets colder and colder exactly as the Bible would predict it would take place. So, and then we look at uh, uh, the fossil record. God's rest answers the fossil record enigma. This actually bothered me when I was nine and ten years of age. Uh, you know, kind of going through uh, biology and realizing we have extensive evidence uh, for speciation events before the arrival of human beings. So, before human beings show up, we see in the fossil record, speciation is so aggressive, we can count about one new species appearing every year on the average. But, what do we see after human beings appear? Nothing. We can't document the appearance of a single animal species in the record of nature since the appearance of human beings. And uh, that's a quote from uh, an atheist who wrote a book on extinctions a number of years ago, Paul Ehrlich. <coughs> so we see all this activity before humans and none afterwards. What does Genesis 1 say? For six days God created. On the seventh day he rested. He ceased from his work of creation. This is also a New Testament principle, John 5. Jesus speaks about himself and his Father at being in a state of rest but resting from their creation work, not resting from the rest of the work. Making the principle that we have a Sabbath, we still feed our children. We stop doing our employment activity, but we continue work in other areas. Well, the first time I read the Bible in any serious way was when I was 17. Uh, I was given the Gideon Bible when I was 11 in the public schools, but didn't read it till I was 17. But when I first picked it up and read the first page, Suddenly the lights went on and said, here's an answer to the fossil record enigma. We see it in the past, because those are the six creation days. We don't see it now, because God's at rest. And you look at Genesis 1, notice that there's no evening and morning for day 7. We're still in the seventh day. You have a closure, a beginning and a closure for the first six days, but not the seventh day. Likewise, Hebrews 4 refers to God's seventh day of rest as an ongoing event through the present, on into the future. So that explains why we don't see speciation today, but why we did see it in the past. Now, at this conference, what I heard over and over again from these atheists is how can you, as a serious scientist, possibly believe what the Bible says about the history of the universe and life here on planet Earth? And what they were stumbling over was this word, yom that's translated as day in Genesis 1. And they all insisted that this word yom had to mean a 24-hour period. So I had to point out to him that Hebrew is not like English. We English speakers are speaking with the largest vocabulary language that has ever existed. Now the vocabulary now exceeds 4 million words. Although uh, Fuzzrata, our biochemist, says about half of that uh, four million words of our biochemical terms. Uh, but that still leaves two million words. Uh, but what you see in uh, Biblical Hebrew, if you don't count the proper nouns, only 3,000 words. And I did point out to these atheists, virtually every Hebrew noun has multiple literal definitions. The word for earth that you see in Genesis 1 has five different literal definitions. The word for heaven has three different definitions, which is why Paul had to say in 1 Corinthians 11 that he was taken up to the third heaven, that to make a distinction about which heaven he's talking about. When it comes to this word day, it's got four different literal definitions. It can mean part of the daylight hours, it can mean all of the daylight hours, like a 12-hour period, or it can mean one rotation period of the earth, which right now is 24 hours, Although if you go back early in Earth's history, it was like 20 hours instead of 24. Uh, or it can mean a long but finite time period. It cannot mean infinite time. And so the longest time period would be long but finite. The other thing that I pointed out to these atheists is that this word day 
is the only option you have in Biblical Hebrew to describe a lot of it by that time period. There is no other word in Biblical Hebrew for a long but finite time period. Now in modern Hebrew, you got two words. You got yom and olam. But in Biblical Hebrew, olam meant indefinite time. It never could be used uh, for uh, finite time. Which means that the time scale issue is not a problem for the Christian faith. And I find that to be the number one reason why atheists, engineers, and scientists reject the Christian faith. This perception that you have to accept the universe being only 10,000 years old or younger in order to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't see that in any doctrinal statement. I've read all the doctrinal statements, I've read all the biblical creeds. Uh, you do not see that in there. It's not an essential of the Christian faith as to uh, when uh, God created the universe and the earth. You could argue that it is important when God created humanity. And this is where we agree with our young earth brethren. We do believe that God created Adam and Eve only thousands of years ago, not millions or billions of years ago. And with respect to Adam, notice what you see in Genesis 2. Genesis 1 tells us that both the male and the female human were created on day 6. So when you read the second creation account, Genesis 2, it gives a list of things that happened between the creation of Adam and the creation of Eve. First it tells us that Adam was created outside the Garden of Eden. Eve was created inside, Adam was created outside. Then Adam had an opportunity to watch the growth of the trees of Eden. And then God put him to work tending the garden. And I think he worked long enough to realize there's got to be more to life uh, than gardening. And God said, great, now I want you to name all the soulish creatures, which would be the birds and the mammals. See, what God was doing, which you see in Genesis 1, God first creates the physical life, then he creates soulish life, last of all, he creates spiritual life. What he does in Genesis 2 is he first introduces Adam to physical life, the plants, then he introduces Adam to soulish life, the birds and the mammals. But what does it say? After he is given an appropriate name for how each of these birds and mammals relates to him, he was still lonely. And then what God does is he has him undergo surgery, puts him to sleep, uh, removes a biopsy from his side. I don't know how big, the text doesn't tell us. He recovers from the surgery, and then he's introduced to a new creature. And what do we see there in the original Hebrew? The moment he sees Eve, out from his mouth comes the word hapa'am. And uh, that's used only four other times in the Old Testament, always translated at long last. So what I've given you here are two of 21 different biblical arguments for why these days must be long time periods, not a short time. And the last thing I shared in the time I had with the atheists is to say, if you take the literal definition of day as a long time period, and you take the reference frame for the six days as the surface of the earth, what does it say in Genesis 1-2? The Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the waters of planet Earth, and it was dark on the surface of the waters. Job 38, verses 9 and 10 tell us why it was dark. It was dark because God blanketed those waters with a cloud layer that kept it dark. So it wasn't dark because of the lack of light, it was dark because of the atmosphere. So with that frame of reference, the scientific accuracy score for everything you see recorded in Genesis 1, the Bible gets a 4 for 4 correct answer on the initial conditions, uh, what Earth was like before the six creation days, and gets a perfect score of 10 for 10 on the creation events. And the whole point is, how can a book that was written 3,400 years ago uh, claim such outstanding accuracy unless indeed Moses was inspired by the one that created the universe and designed the planet for a benefit. That was kind of a one-two punch because the first part I talked about how uh, the Bible accurately predicted thousands of years ahead of time that we live in a continuously expanding universe. No book of philosophy, science, or theology even hinted that the universe might be continuously expanding until 1917. 1917, Albert Einstein, through his equations of general relativity, said if you solve my equations, it indicates the universe expands. That was the first time any author outside of the Bible even hinted at that. 
Anyway, we want to read more about that. You'll find it in our book, The Genesis Question. Uh, but if you really want to go after these atheists and the skeptics, uh, we recommend this book. Uh, it's called uh, Creation as Science. And what we do in Creation as Science, the book came out two years ago. We made 90 predictions in that book of what scientists would discover in the next three or four years. Predictions that are distinct from theistic evolution, young earth creationism, and atheistic naturalism. So we put the four models side by side, 90 predictions, where they're predicting very different things, and all the point is, there's no need for anyone to fight over creation evolution. We wait three or four years and see whose predictions come true and whose predictions fail to come true. Uh, but in February, I'm bringing a new book called More Than a Theory, where we basically look at those 90 predictions that were made two years ago and say, let's look at the scorecard and see how the four models did. But uh, hey, if you don't like books, uh, we've got this thing called uh, Journey Toward uh, Creation. It's a DVD, uh, which kind of takes you on a journey from the beginning of the universe to the present day, thanks to these telescopes. And I'm not here to sell books and DVDs. Something brand new we've launched at Reasons to Believe. I don't think we have them here for you today, but what we're trying to do in churches is to make available, free of charge, these uh, equipping cards. And each card, I've got a card right here, for example. Now, here's one. Can humans design a perfect universe? Another one. Is purposeful design an illusion or reality? Is the Bible scientifically accurate? We give a quick answer. We show them a reference. Uh, but if you turn it over, you're able to get free of charge uh, this magazine, uh, which keeps you up to date on the latest scientific discoveries. Anyway, I want to encourage you as pastors to really take advantage of this. I mean, you can get your people handing out these little things. It arouses curiosity gets some thinking, opens up opportunities for your people to witness to their non-Christian friends and associates. And likewise, this magazine, a great thing to put in your doctor's or dentist's office as a, as a reading material. <coughs> so with that, what I want to do uh, is segue to your questions and comments. What can we do at Reasons to Believe? And keep in mind, there's a chapter here. Uh, one of our bigger chapters, this is the biggest chapter we have in Canada, the Vancouver chapter of Reasons to Believe. Say, so what's the chapter? There are volunteers who've gone through our training courses, have equipped themselves to speak and teach in these kinds of issues in your churches and also the business firms of where your people work. I encourage you to take advantage of these people. There's a clipboard at the back where you can sign up and uh, get involved in finding out what's going on. And what we're trying to do with reasons to believe is to work with churches. I've been teaching a science apologetics class in my church for the past 35 years. And what I notice is our one class gets more visitors than the rest of the church combined. And you know, our class is the one that's drawing in all these unbelievers. We would like to see a science apologetics class planted in every church in North America. So I want you to take advantage of the people in the Vancouver chapter. They're ready and willing to come into your church uh, to launch a class, and I say launch it because the real goal is to get your people equipped to carry it on so they can go to another church and launch another one. Uh, so you want to give away some books, I think. All right, we'll do that before we have the Q&A. Uh, I'm going to get, let you do a couple of questions. Uh, just to, I'm going to go around and uh, pick up the rest of the cards because I haven't quite got all of them. And then here's the other thing is that um, if you put your card in and you would allow your name to be on our mailing list, then you don't have to sign. Uh, you, if you want to be on our Reasons to Believe chapter mailing list and be aware of your events, as an, I can have another list. But if you put your thing in here, we can use this for being on your mailing list. That's part of what, what the idea is. So I'll let uh, Hugh take a couple of questions, and then I'll just interrupt um, and uh, make that draw. So just. Uh, Okay, first question, comment, anyone? And by the way, it doesn't have to be what I'm talking about here. I'll take anything that pertains to a science faith issue. Yes? What was that last thing in Job? You said there was a number of uh, predictions and the latest one that, that happened in the last nine months. So. Yeah, um, I'm not going to be speaking on it here in Vancouver, but I'm going to be going on to Washington, D.C. And the church there has asked me to address that very topic. It's Job 19. 
pardon me, Job 38, 19, and 20. And what the verse says is God challenging Job and his philosopher friends. Do you know where darkness resides? Can you point me to the location of darkness? Well, what you see in that verse is that darkness is not the absence of light. It's actually something tangible. And today we've been able to prove, on today, the last couple of years, to demonstrate that indeed darkness is something that's tangible. It's not the lack of light. It's something that actually has physical substance to it. In fact, darkness, we now can measure, makes up 99.73% of all the stuff of the universe. So you go outside, look at the stars and galaxies, that's only 0.27%. Exotic dark matter, ordinary dark matter, and dark energy makes up 99.73% of all the stuff of the universe. But it's only been in the past year that astronomers have been able to identify exactly where the exotic dark matter lies where the ordinary dark matter lies and where the dark energy lies. And what we've discovered in the process is that the fine-tuning on the location of the darkness is some of the most spectacular evidence we've ever uncovered scientifically for supernatural design. To give you one example, uh, the dark energy, the constant that governs dark energy, in order for the un basically what darkness does is it regulates how fast the universe expands. So if you get too much of the dark stuff, it'll expand so slowly that the universe makes nothing but black holes. But if you expand it too quickly, then all you get is gas. You will never get stars, planets, or galaxies. It must be expanded at just the right rate in order to get the stars and the galaxies and planets that would make life possible. You say, well, what kind of fine-tuning are you talking about? If you were to change the constant that governs dark energy, by one part in 10 to the 122, there is no possibility for life anytime, anywhere in the universe. That's 122 zeros after the one. Uh, or to give you a point of comparison, the very best example I could give you of human engineering design achievement would be the LIGO instrument. That's a gravity wave telescope. Uh, one piece of it's in the state of Washington, the other piece is in Louisiana. This instrument is so well engineered, it can make length measurements to one part per 10 to the 23. It needs to be that well engineered where you've got no hope of detecting gravity waves. Now, we compare that with the dark energy term, it tells us that the one that designed dark energy at a minimum is 10 trillion 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 times more intelligent and more knowledgeable than the Caltech and MIT physicists uh, who designed the LIGO instrument, and at least that many times better funded. <laughs> so, in that sense, uh, Job, uh, the oldest book in the Bible, is right up to date. And as I said, there's another uh, 49 questions that still remain to be answered. So, and by the way, I kind of look at those 59 questions that God asked. Those are the questions we need answers to if we're going to fulfill the command that God gave to Adam and Eve. What did he say to Adam and Eve? Manage the resources of the planet for the benefit of all life. And in Job, he tells us all the things we need to know in order to do that. I think what's really humbling is that we can only answer 10 of those questions today. Can we keep your question just for, um, and uh, so if um, so you want to drop, you want to get to drop three, three of them out there, if we can? One, two, uh, just for those, um, uh, just before I announce those, um, let's give them there for me. Um, Dr. Uh, Ross was here all weekend, and uh, tonight he uh, is speaking at the UBC, um, uh, at the Henning Building. And uh, if you would like um, uh, some advertisement or let somebody know, it's not too late to do that. It'll be at 7 o'clock. Tomorrow he's here at 10 o'clock. Uh, speaking to people as well, um, and th this is all on this little poster. Uh, uh, tomorrow afternoon, he'll be at uh, Chapters at Granville and um, Broadway. Granville and uh, Broadway. Uh, Broadway uh, signing uh, his latest book, which um, you could just hold that book up there. Uh, that, that's one of the ones we're just going to give away. Uh, in the evening, um, he's at the H.R. McMillan uh, Space Center. 
in the, and that's, uh, uh, it'll cost $10 to attend that, but uh, it'll be a very, I believe, entertaining um, event that uh, uh, I think they'll hold a couple hundred people in that room. Uh, and then um, Sunday morning, he's speaking at Granville Chapel in the worship service as well. So we're just really, um, if you would like to know these, I'll have these at the back. And uh, if you uh, are interested in taking some, some posters with you, you're welcome to do that. So um, for these books, uh, that first one, which is The Fingerprint of God, I think that was your first book that really impacted me, uh, Jade Holloway. Holonia. If you could, uh, there we go. And Thank the you. second book, uh, um, the, the Creation of Science, um, Tim Kiefer. There's Tim. All from this and, side. Uh, <laughs> The third book, um, which is, is a brand new one, uh, Dan Peters. So the uh, next question. Go ahead. Oh, there's sort of a cultural consensus that uh, man has evolved from apes, that have evolved from lower species. So how do you relate that? Okay, he's asked me about uh, how do you respond to the claim that man has evolved uh, from the apes and apes from lower species. Well, I think one of the books we got back there, I hope it's back there, is called Who is Adam? It's a book that uh, our staff biochemists, yeah, we do have it, because all Ron and I wrote. And basically we tell a story in that book about how there's been a revolution in the story of the origin of humanity, a scientific revolution. And predominantly because of uh, genetics, is that uh, because of advances in genetics, we can now look at the genome of humans that have been dead for 20,000, 30,000, 35,000 years. We can also recover the remains of Neanderthal. And, uh, you know, at last count, they've uh, analyzed the mitochondrial DNA from 12 different Neanderthal specimens. Now, Neanderthal covers the range of about 35,000 years ago to about 150,000 years ago. And they got samples across that whole range and also across the whole geographical range uh, from Asia into Europe, they cannot see any change in the DNA for Neanderthal, which means over 120,000 years, nothing happens. Now, likewise, look at the human genome over the past 35 to 40,000 years. Likewise, we can't measure any change in the DNA. So it shows you that we humans have not experienced any significant evolution. And Neanderthal, likewise, we don't see any significant evolution. Now you might say, wouldn't it be great if you can dig back into Homo erectus, which is the next species of bipedal primate previous to Neanderthal? The problem with Homo erectus is the time span is 200,000 years ago to 1.8 million years ago. And uh, you know, if you watch Jurassic Park, there's a big flaw in Jurassic Park. DNA that's older than 150,000 years will be so corrupted, it's useless. And so that means we can forget about trying to do anything with Homo erectus DNA. It's going to be way too corrupted. However, we do have bones. And we've got bones that cover the whole range from 200,000 years ago to 1.8 million years ago. The bone structure of Homo erectus shows no evidence of evolution. The oldest stuff is the same as the youngest stuff. Well, if Homo erectus doesn't evolve, Neanderthal doesn't evolve, and humans don't evolve, there goes the whole story of the descent of man hypothesis that Charles Darwin uh, popularized in the last century. Now, we can go further. You can look at the human species, and you can sample people alive today. And what they do is they pick up people, all different ethnic groups, and they look at the mitochondrial DNA, which we get from our mothers. Now, all of us have mitochondrial DNA, but the father makes no contribution. And so by looking at the mitochondrial DNA, you can trace what's happening on the female side of the human genome. And when you do that, again, we see very little differentiation. And the differentiation we do see tells us that women descended from one woman about 50,000 years ago. So it tells us that we're all descended from a single woman. Now, how do they refer to this woman in the scientific literature? They call her Eve. So when you read all the scientific journals, that's the name they put on this mitochondrial DNA first woman. When you do the same thing on the male side, that's Y chromosome. You only get Y chromosomes from your father. You know, women don't have Y chromosomes. 
Uh, and with Y chromosome, you actually get more accurate results. I mean, if I were to give you the error bars on the women's side, it's 50,000 years, plus or minus about 20,000 years. So it's not that accurate. But on the male side, because you're looking with nuclear DNA rather than mitochondrial DNA, you get much more accurate results. That tells us, again, that we're descended from one man. Not many, but one man. And this one man lived 46,000 to 54,000 years ago. So it's right on that 50,000. Now, the other story we tell in the book is today we can document cultural big bangs. Uh, one of the things that really astounded uh, uh, anthropologists is to learn that the first humans were living in climate zones 15 degrees colder than the Neanderthals. They did overlap a little bit. And Neanderthals are very well adapted for cold weather. Huge nasal capacity, uh, they got a barrel-shaped body, short limbs, uh, which is exactly what you need for living in a cold climate. And yet here are these skinny, tall human beings living in a place that was 15 degrees colder than they could live. And it really explains why the Neanderthals went extinct almost immediately upon the appearance of human beings. Uh, they outcompeted them because they exploited clothing. The Neanderthals were naked, the humans wore clothes. And so they were able to uh, outcompete uh, the Neanderthals. The other thing we notice is that um, when humans show up, there's a tool explosion. Uh, with Neanderthals, you've got a Neanderthal taking a big rock, smashing it against another rock, getting some plates that they use to scrape flesh off the bones. That's their most sophisticated tool. But the moment that humans show up, you see harpoons, uh, you see fish hooks with barbs on them, you see needles with a hole in them for sewing, you see axes uh, and uh, shovels and hammers, all that shows up immediately. And then I think what is very surprising is they see a jewelry big bang. Uh, the moment that humans show up, jewelry's everywhere. In fact, what they notice is the jewelry outnumbers the tools by about a factor of 10 to 1. <laughs> and, yeah, I know, it's the same ratio we've got today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but with other species, no jewelry. Only humans use jewelry. There's a language explosion. Well, they now can date when these explosions occurred. They all come in around 40,000 years ago. They say, well, that's inconsistent with a 50. Not really, because now you're looking at archaeological remains. It takes a significant population growth before you're going to get recoverable archaeological remains. So the 40,000 year date is exactly what you'd expect if indeed the origin of humanity took place 50,000 years ago. The other thing you'll see in that book is we actually come up with a calibration for the genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11. See, how do you do that? Well, we got a good historical date for when Abraham lived, both from the biblical historical records and extra biblical records tell us that he was alive about 4,000 years ago. Also, what you see in Genesis 11 uh, genealogy is a guy by the name of Pelech. He's halfway between Noah and Abraham. You go back one page to Genesis 10, that tells us that the world was divided in the days of Pelech. Now, we believe that's a reference to the breaking of the Bering Land Bridge. That, uh, you know, with the Ice Age beginning to subside, you have these bridges joining Britain to France. Australia was easily, you could easily migrate to Australia. Uh, there is a bridge between Vancouver Island and the mainland, from the Queen Charlotte's to the mainland. And then there is this big bridge between Siberia and Alaska. And uh, we, get, we have carbon-14 dating that tells us that those bridges disappeared 11,000 years ago. Well, if Peleg was alive 11,000 years ago, and if Abraham was alive 4,000 years ago, and the lifespans recorded in those two genealogies are proportional to the passage of time, you get a rough date for the flood of Noah of about 35 to 40,000 years ago, and a rough date for Adam and Eve about 50,000 years ago, give or take uh, 10,000 years. Now, what you notice in the book is all these things are agreeing. It's also noted by atheist scientists. If you read the British journal Nature or the American journal Science or you read the anthropological literature, they're referring to this new paradigm as the Garden of Eden hypothesis. And everywhere you look at the way they describe the hypothesis, they're using biblical terminology. And it's because of the fact that there's new evidence. Number one, overturns the previous paradigm, and it matches what we see in the Bible uh, so well 
that they actually use, a biblical terminology that to describe it. And I can add just one more thing. There's one part of the Garden of Eden hypothesis they can't solve, which is why they're still calling it an hypothesis rather than a theory. The problem is the DNA evidence, where you look at stable populations like Jews or uh, Armenians or Finns or Estonians or Japanese, uh, population groups that don't have a lot of migration in or out. If you compare mitochondrial DNA to Y chromosome DNA, it consistently shows that uh, Adam comes a lot later than Eve uh, by several thousand years. And this is referred to in the scientific literature as the younger Adam paradox, which is why they're still calling it the Garden of Eden uh, hypothesis rather than the Garden of Eden uh, theory. Now, from a biblical perspective, there's a resolution of the younger Adam paradox. What does the flood account tell us? That the entire human species is descended from eight people on board Noah's Ark. But there's a big DNA difference between the men and the women. The four men on board the Ark are all blood-related to the one man Noah. So the Y chromosome does not take you back to Adam from a biblical perspective, it's going to stop at Noah. The four women on board the ark are not blood related, which means the bottleneck for mitochondrial DNA could easily go all the way back to Eve herself. Therefore, we can explain the several thousand year difference in the DNA evidence, but only a biblical perspective solves the problem of the younger Adam paradox. That was a long answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's something we're very excited about, reasons to believe, as you can tell. Yes? How do you respond to um, uh, some who would argue that using prophetic literature or um, poetic Hebrew literature as a genre attached to a historical development period, um, using that kind of language to develop scientific cosmology, is that appropriate use of of the biblical text in the way that it's formulated as a genre? Well, as you can probably figure out, I've been involved in a number of debates with young earth creationists. Uh, in fact, uh, some of them have been televised. We've got DVDs if you want to watch them. If you get them from us, you'll see the debates exactly as they happened. The other side edits them, but we don't edit them. We get them exactly as it happened. But that was an issue that they raised. They say, you seem to rely heavily on these poetic creation accounts. And from a young earth perspective, they actually accuse me of taking the Bible too literally. Uh, because their whole point is poetry is figurative, and uh, we shouldn't be reading poetry as, uh, uh, as literally as, as I do. And they said, no, narrative always trumps poetry. I said, well, that's not what I learned from seminary professors. What I learned from seminary professors is that narrative passages must be interpreted in the light of didactic passages. And didactic passages can either be prose or poetry. And so what I said in one of these debates is, you know, the Old Testament's strongest and clearest didactic teaching on the doctrine of the Trinity comes from the book of Isaiah. And 100% of that content is poetry. And therefore, just because it's poetic, doesn't discount it from being reliable or trustworthy or literal in its communication. Uh, from my perspective, whether it's poetry or prose, you look at the context to see whether or not we take it metaphorically or we take it literally. Yes, there's lots of poetry that's metaphoric, but not all poetry is metaphoric. And if it is metaphoric, then we are obligated to figure out what the metaphor is. And uh, once we figure out what the metaphor is, then we can kind of literally interpret what the text is saying. So, uh, all of you have taken hermeneutics classes, so I'm just telling you stuff you already know. Yes? Can you give us uh, a good layman's answer what they were hoping to prove with the atom smasher in Europe. Okay, what they're hoping to find with the Large Hadron Collider, which is now uh, at a commission because of some design issues with the magnets and the wiring, uh, they were hoping to find the God particle. That's literally what they call it, the God particle, uh, otherwise known as the Higgs boson. And, uh, you know, in particle physics, uh, we have lots of fermions, which are kind of the particles that at mass, and the bosons which exchange the, uh, in fact, you guys, I'm sure there's, there's a particle physicist right here in the room, so uh, one of our chapter volunteers is a, is a particle physicist, so uh, you can find out more about this. 
but the goal of particle physics, experimental particle physics, is to find one of these boson fermion pairs. And uh, the Higgs boson will give us that. And, uh, you know, I don't know a particle physicist alive that doesn't doubt that the Higgs boson is there. But discovering it would really help us nail down in a much more detailed and precise manner the particle creation model. And, you know, if I could just say a little bit of advertising about that model. The remarkable thing about the people who do research at the very smallest end of the scale of particle physicists is they wind up shaking hands with those of us who do research at the very largest scales. So what happens in the arena of the very tiny uh, dramatically impacts what happens in the arena of the very large. Uh, for example, if we can really nail down the mass of the Higgs boson, we can probably figure out what exotic mass particles make up 26% of all the stuff in the universe, probably 23%. Uh, we've already discovered neutrinos. Uh, but we astronomers think that neutralinos and axions are probably uh, going to be a more predominant component of that exotic matter than the neutrinos that we can already see. That big particle accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider, could really guide astronomers in discovering it. On the other hand, there's a bunch of my friends who are looking at the cooling rate of white dwarf binary stars, and they're convinced that they're going to beat the Large Hadron Collider to discovering the axion. So they're kind of having a race. But the whole point is they actually wind up shaking hands working at the very large scales and the very small scales. Can I just ask a follow-up question? I was reading in, I think it was the National Post, some physicists out of Oxford or, or Cambridge saying, in his study of that, that it was kind of a proof, he backed kind of an oscillating theory. Have you heard that? Well, um, where the oscillating universe model is now stuck, is that, uh, in fact, I got a paper in my briefcase that talks you about it. You use the word oscillating big bangs. Yeah, well, just to make, bring the rest of you up to speed on this, the oscillating universe model is basically the model you find in the Hindu Vedas. It's the idea that the universe goes through cycles. It has a beginning, it grows, it shrinks, it begins, grows, and shrinks. Uh, but the Hindu Vedas made an enormous error because they gave a number. They said the period of the cycles is 4.32 billion years, and we know that's wrong. Uh, but also we know that there's no mechanism that can force the universe to rebound. The universe's measure of entropy, remember what the Bible says the entire universe is subject to the law of decay? The rate of decay is 100 million times greater than what would permit the possibility of a rebounding universe. So in that sense, reincarnation has been proven wrong. When I talk to Hindus, I say, if the Vedas are wrong about the reincarnating universe, then why should we trust it when it talks about reincarnating humans or reincarnating spiders? Uh, but now what some physicists, by the way, this is all coming from people who don't like the God of the Bible. What they're doing is saying, is there some way we can revive the oscillating universe model? All they're left with is what's called point care occurrences. And what that means, Poincaré came up with this more than 100 years ago. Uh, an illustration would be to take this room. This room is filled with quadrillions of air molecules. And uh, the laws of thermodynamics tell us they're randomly bouncing off one another. Brownian motion, you've probably heard of that. Well, there's actually a tiny statistical probability that all the quadrillions of air molecules that are randomly bouncing off one another in this room will suddenly bounce all together and wind up in that corner of the room over there and will all suffocate to death from lack of oxygen. Now, some astronomers have said maybe the universe is the same way. After all, the universe is subject to Brownian motion. And maybe all these stars and galaxies randomly bumping into them with their gravitational influences uh, could suddenly wind up with all the mass of the universe being one little tiny cubic centimeter off in distant space somewhere. And that would be like the beginning of the universe. Everything now compact, but of course Brownian movement would cause the whole thing to come out like that. Now, the paper I got in my briefcase actually calculates the probability of a Poincaré occurrence in the universe. And what I like about the paper, never in the scientific literature has such a tiny probability ever been published. <laughs> but the whole point is they're actually able to calculate what that probability is uh, but the point of the paper, and I'm actually going to talk about it tonight when I'm at UBC, I'm going to pull that paper out. Uh, it makes the point 
that this is an absurd hypothesis because the probability is just so ridiculously tiny. And the paper winds up concluding, therefore, we really are stuck uh, with a supernatural being beyond space and time creating the universe and performing miracles for reasons of his own. And that's all because of dark energy. And so the last sentence in the paper, the paper was written by three atheist theoretical physicists. In fact, one of them spoke at this uh, conference where I was doing the debate. He gave the uh, second lecture, uh, Leonard Susskind. And what he and his associates said, therefore, dark energy must be wrong. And the title of the paper is Disturbing Implications of Dark Energy. And so the disturbing implication is it points to this supernatural entity performing miracles for reasons of his own. And they said, that's so utterly disturbing, dark energy must be wrong. And that paper was posted for several months on the Los Alamos website of preprints in theoretical physics. But what happened in those several months is astronomers came up with nine independent observational proofs that dark energy is real. Not only real, that makes up 72% of all the stuff in the universe. So rather than let the paper be published, the three authors pulled the paper from the Los Alamos website. It's never been published because it didn't agree with their theological perspective. So, yeah, biases happen in science too. It's not just theologians that have biases. <coughs> What's yes. your response to uh, is it Collins, uh, the fellow that Francis uh, Collins? Francis Collins uh, wrote the book uh, Language of God. And right. His uh, his idea that I think he's an evolutionist. He's a theistic evolutionist. Oh, okay. 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 Well, if you want to hear the whole scoop, uh, Francis Collins agreed to be interviewed by our scholar team on our program, uh, Creation Update. Uh, every uh, week we uh, do a two-hour show uh, on the web, and it's archived. And uh, you can hear the two-hour interview we had with uh, Francis Collins. And what we've been doing on a few of our shows, most shows talk about the latest scientific discoveries. But occasionally, we'll interview one of the leaders on the creation evolution spectrum. And you'll notice we didn't debate him. We basically asked him questions so that people can understand where he's coming from and why. Uh, but, and incidentally, uh, he told me over the phone that he really likes what we're doing and reasons to believe. It's just that he thinks we go too far putting God into the science. That's kind of where we disagree. Uh, but what we discovered in that interview is that Francis Collins is a theistic evolutionist uh, because of junk DNA. He's still kind of stuck in that camp of 10 years ago of thinking that 98% of the human genome is junk, and that junk is explained by evolutionary baggage being accumulated as light evolves over the past 3.8 billion years. And uh, we were rather surprised that he wasn't up to date on the discoveries of the newfound purposes uh, for that uh, junk DNA. So, but, you know, his comment is, if you guys wind up proving me wrong, then I'll be able, I'll be happy to adopt your model. So, and from our perspective, you know, uh, if we can find mistakes in our model or adjustments that need to be made, we will make them. Uh, as, you know, theologians and scientists critique our material. But uh, he was very friendly, uh, but definitely is a theistic evolutionist. But hey, uh, the junk DNA, I think, makes a strong case that you cannot explain out of the apes or human beings through any kind of theistic evolution. Uh, yes. Ross, as far as um, the, the appearance of humans, if I have it right, the, uh, the differences are genetics, intelligence, and also a spiritual uh, searching or, or development. But what, I, I, I'm trying to get around the corner of how to understand the humanoid bipedal, is that the term you're using? A any, anything that, that helps us understand their appearance, how do we classify them? Right, well, let, well, we'll get to your first point first, which is uh, you know, this whole idea, you know, where are the differences? And uh, you know, you've probably heard this on PBS and Discovery a lot, that uh, apes, or pardon me, chimpanzees and humans have 98% similarity in their DNA. Well, it's only looking at a small part of the genome. Basically, the genome, where it's governing proteins that determine the architecture of internal organs. 
And that indeed is remarkably similar, which is why, for example, you can take a heart out of a baboon and put it in a human being. And it's not that different. Uh, likewise, uh, the liver and the kidneys aren't that different. Uh, but where we do see the differences, and by the way, look at the entire genome of the chimpanzee and the entire genome of human beings, the similarities between 85 and 90 percent. That's not 98 percent. That's a lot less. But in terms of that part where they're looking at the proteins that govern organ uh, structure, where they saw radical differences was on the brain. Tremendous similarity on the pancreas, the liver, the stomach, I mean, all that stuff is virtually identical. And we look at the, uh, the uh, DNA, we look at the brain, radical difference. And also we look inside the skull of a human being, like Neanderthals, for example, had a brain capacity as large as ours. Uh, the brain to body mass ratio is bigger for humans than Neanderthals, but the brain size is about the same. But what we notice is Neanderthal had a lot of brain structure to support his nose, kind of like a dog. Uh, a dog's brain, 40% of it supports the nose. Uh, with the human brain, almost none supports the nose. Uh, and what you see instead is that uh, the human brain has structures to support mathematics, meditation, and uh, spiritual activity. And you only see that in the human species. It's not in any of the bipedal primates. It's only in humans that you see that structure. Now, as to why God would create uh, 10 different bipedal primate species previous to human beings, and again we have this in our book, is that um, when humans arrived here in North America, within a thousand years they brought to extinction 85% of all the large mammal, uh, large, bir large body bird and mammal species. Same thing happened in South America. Same thing happened in Australia. It didn't happen in Africa. For Africa, only 14% have been brought to extinction through human invasion. So 14% for Africa, 85 to 88% uh, for North America, South America, and Australia. What's the difference? North America, South America, and Australia had no bipedal primates previous to human beings, zero. Whereas Africa has 10, and there may be more that they're going to discover. Now, in terms of why God protected Africa and didn't protect North and South America, it's the African content which has the highest number of large-bodied bird and mammal species. So that would, uh, from God's perspective, uh, deserve his intervention. And you say, how are you talking about? What you notice about these 10 species is they're spread over six and a half million years. But each species that succeeds a previous one is a little more efficient at hunting large bird and mammal species. <coughs> Neanderthal, for example, exclusively fed on large body bird and mammal species. That's all it ate, ate nothing else. And so what this does is it allows the birds and mammals to step by step over six and a half million years gradually adapt to the coming future shock of human beings. Now I say future shock because human beings are unique and they can hunt anything they want. Every other species of life on the planet, including the Neanderthals and Homo erectus, had to content themselves with hunting those creatures that were sick or dying, injured, or is simply not paying attention. Uh, we human beings are able to kill the very best. I mean, that's what a lot of you people do. You go down to the wilds of British Columbia, and you want a trophy. I mean, you want the best meat. And so you'll get the, uh, the trophy or the, you know, a nice young female for great meat. If you want something to hang in your wall, you're going to get the, you know, that, that, that stud male. Well, no other carnivore is able to do that. And because we're able to do that, we can do huge damage to these species. Because we're basically killing off the best rather than the worst. All the other carnivores kill off the worst. And that actually en enhances the health of the species. So we're the one species that can destroy the health of the species. But what we think is happening is that God in advance prepared these birds and mammals so that they could actually uh, you know, get a little more practice in running away from these guys that are wearing clothes and carrying sticks that shoot out fire. But that's an hypothesis. There's nothing in the Bible to support that. But I do find it interesting that we do see this difference between Africa and North America, for example. 
think it's about time. You, I know that some people would like to go, um, and some of you may wish to uh, stay back and uh, peruse the books or have more questions. I think Dr. Ross is going to stay around for a little bit, or you could also come to some of the other events. Um, but uh, I think we're really grateful uh, for for Dr. Ross's uh, explanation. It's really, really <laughs> Yeah, they've asked me to uh, speak on my latest book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. And uh, that book was really written, at least in part, to respond to the likes of Richard Dawkins. Because uh, what Dawkins says in his book, and uh, also Victor Stenger in God the Failed Hypothesis, is there can't be a God because God did such a lousy job of making the universe. But the fallacy is they only see one reason for the Christian God making the universe the way he did. And so what I do in the book is I go through the Bible and pull up 12 different reasons why God created the universe. And say the laws of physics that we see governing the universe are optimally designed to fulfill simultaneously all 12 purposes. And I kind of use the analogy of when you go out and buy a car. You know, when you go out and buy a car, you can get a car with great mileage or you can get a car with great performance. But you're not going to be able to buy a car that simultaneously has optimal performance and optimal fuel efficiency. However, when we look at the universe, we see there's design without trade-offs. And so really, I think at, when you get through the book, you're going to be utterly humbled at how amazingly designed the universe is to fulfill all the purposes. And it also deals with the atheist misconception uh, that uh, God's destiny, uh, from a Christian perspective, is this universe. It's not. God creates this universe to bring about the end of evil and suffering. And when that happens, the universe will have fulfilled its purpose. As God spoke it into existence, he'll speak it out of existence. And uh, from my wife, who was the main editor in the book, she said what she liked the most was a description of what the next creation is going to be like. Uh, I kind of take you to the fun exercise of going through the last two chapters of the Bible and figuring out the dimensions and the laws of physics that will exist in the new creation and what kind of existence we can expect uh, given those new laws of physics and the new uh, dimensions. Uh, I don't even think they're going to be space-time dimensions, but they will be dimensions that permit geography and temporality. Uh, so that's what I'm going to speak about uh, tomorrow uh, at the uh, at planetarium. Uh, may I add that uh, the books that we have available are all $10. They're a cost uh, for you folks to get the information out. So if you'd like any, uh, thank you very much.